Welcome back to another episode of What We Didn't Say on Sunday. My name is Jordan Massey. I'm here with David Chauncey. David serves as our lead pastor at Westside Baptist Church, and I have the privilege of being our Southwest campus pastor. And on most Sundays, we both get the opportunity to preach. And every Sunday that we preach, there are things that are left on the cutting room floor. Things that we simply don't get to are sermon leftovers. And so that's the purpose of this podcast, for us to share with you what we didn't say on Sunday. Well, hey, Pastor David. Hi, Jordan. Welcome back to another episode. And it's great to be together today. This is going to be, we do this every once in a while, these kind of interesting episodes where one of us preached and the other didn't. So technically, because you didn't preach this Sunday, everything that you're going to say yes. is what you didn't say on Sunday. And I had the opportunity to preach, so I'll have some things to share. But uh, this might be a shorter episode, but we don't like to make those kinds of promises no. because uh, we'll end up talking for at least 40 minutes and it'll be a normal length episode. But hey, this Sunday, Willie Rice preached here at Newberry yes. Road. I say here because we're in the studio here at Newberry Road and I preached at the Southwest Campus. Interestingly enough, Dr. Kevin Smith preached on Wednesday and some on Thursday on Philippians 2, 1 to 18. Mm. So that was the text I preached on. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. The hey, leftovers awesome. from Philippians 2, 1 to 18 from my sermon uh, this past Sunday. And then you can chime in with whatever you've got, which is yes. which is everything. You didn't Not say anything much. Yes. about that text. Well, I've been getting ready to heading to on a mission trip. Yes. So I've, I've been getting ready for that trip. I've had a lot of things, so uh, but this is a familiar passage and one of the great passages. We say that a lot. Yeah, uh, one of the great passages in all of Scripture. Uh, so I hate that I didn't get a chance to preach it, but I'm glad you did. Yes, and it was it was a privilege and a joy to do it. So, but hey, well, I'm going to begin by just uh, doing a three minute sermon recap. Because that's what we do every week. We you can want have my three minutes if you want. I think I'll, I, I want to keep in keep the right. keep in the rhythm, keep in the habit, and we we want you to know what we did say before we talk about what we didn't say. And and the reality is, the majority of our list listeners never hear what I say. We've got a few of our folks from the Southwest campus that tune in, mm -hmm. but uh, for the most part, uh, that sermon's not heard except for the people in the room on Sunday morning. So the sermon I'm recap. I'm not sure on the people that hear what I say hear what I say. <laughs> They're hearing it, but uh, yes, uh, no, that's not true. I get a lot of great feedback, and it's it, it really at some point will will probably have a, a way for you to be heard more often yeah. by our listeners. Yeah, and uh, because I know you do a great job with that, and and it's still great that you do your recap and they get to hear you on this. Yep. So that's that's what we're doing. We want you to know what we did say before we talk about what we didn't say. So here goes my best attempt at a three minute sermon recap, starting now. So I began with the example of my three-and-a-half-year-old treating commands like options because this is what toddlers do. They begin to think that you are merely a good suggestion of options, and they get to choose. And so you tell them to go to bed, and they say no, or how about this? We'll do something else. And so I, I, I began to talk about how we think that's funny, but we do the same thing with the Lord. We take commands in Scripture, and we make them optional. And We've done this with humility, which is what this text is on. We've made humility this kind of mystical personality trait. There's just that humble kind of person, and we'll even talk about it like, I just don't know what it is about him. He's just humble. And uh, what we've done in that is we've confused a clear command in Scripture that we are to be humble, and we've confused what humility is. Humility is doing the work of humility. It's action. And so uh, my main idea was humility is not an option for Christians. And I just looked at that text and Philippians 2, 1 to 18, and looked at three big reasons why it's not an option. The first one is Paul talks about it as if it's something we've already been given, that because of our faith, that this is a guaranteed fruit of our faith. He says, have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's something we already have, we already possess. It is a fruit of faith. And so if we are Christians... We should be humble. Uh, I, I said a prideful Christian is a contradiction. And so that was that first point. It's not an option because it is 
a guaranteed fruit of our faith. It's something we've been given in our salvation in Christ. But then secondly, I talked about it is the example that Jesus set that we're obligated to imitate. It's, it's the standard for living. And I looked at the Christ hymn and how Jesus, uh, his example of humanity is, is most clear in the incarnation, in his humility. He gives us that example as servant, and we're called to imitate that standard. But then thirdly, it's one of our primary tools for sharing the gospel, our humility. And uh, Paul says, you'll be like lights that shine in the darkness amongst a twisted and crooked generation when you stop grumbling and disputing and just serve one another and love and care for each other. And then my challenge at the end was, hey, this isn't an option, so do the work of humility. Again, this isn't something mystical that we have to figure out, how do I become a humble person? No, uh, all of the things in Philippians 2 are actions. We put the interest of the other in front of our own. We look to the example of Jesus in which he doesn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. He takes on the form of a servant. We, we do the work of humility, and that's how we put that into practice. Because it's not an option, it's a command. And I'm out of time, but I'm done. Mm. There we go. Great. That's awesome. There we go. So that was my sermon from Sunday in, yeah. in three minutes. Well, that is cool. Well, you want me to give sort of what I might have said? Yeah, sure. If I had. I won't you know, even put you uh, on a timer. You don't have to put me on a timer. It won't be that long. But, um, you know, I would have kind of continued a little bit with the joy theme yeah. in that even in this first verse or two, Paul says, complete my joy by being a certain way. Yeah. And he wants them to be of the same soul and the same phronos, the same mind, the same heart and the same mind. And there's something about unity that brings uh, an incredible amount of potential impact in our world. He says you're going to shine as lights in the darkness. Mm -hmm. You're going to have greater joy and effectiveness. Uh, But to have that kind of unity and to have that unity of mind and purpose, uh, you have to think differently. And this word mind, as we see through Scripture, uh, in Philippians is one of the key words. And, and, he, and I really just want our folks through this entire thing to see that joy is impact, impacted much more by your thinking than your circumstances. Mm. Happenings great create happiness, but our circumstances are going to go up and down. But if we have the mind of Christ, if our mind is right, our joy can can kind of be continued through all of this. And, and this unity is, is going to be a challenge because people go up and down and our relationships go up and down. And so uh, Christ is our great model of that, and we can't escape his example. It's, it's like you said, it's the example. Mm. We have this uh, fruit, like you said, but we also have this um, responsibility. Yeah. And I preached this a, a while back, and uh, the title was The Way Up is Down. And there was hmm. a, this is kind of my, my illustration I would have used. There's a street in England, I bet there's others, but there's a street over in Great Britain where it has this, it fools your senses because you get on it in your car and it looks like you're going up uphill. Mm. Everything in your body, your mind, everything says that's uphill, and yet you roll up the hill. It's it's a we need this we need to go experience we this. Do. I've never, yeah. but I've read wow. about it, studied up on it, so it's a real thing. And and I when I preached this previously, people said, "Yeah, I've been on it," but you're thinking this is going to be a burden going up, hmm. but all of a sudden you're rolling up, and everything about our culture. Our political world, our business world, everything is the way to go up in life is to grasp Mm. and to work and to conquer and to compete. But what Jesus shows us as it ends this wonderful section on his divinity, it says, and God highly exalted him. Mm -hmm. But the exaltation, the going up came through going down. Mm. And the way up as a Christian, I think, is always going down in humility, mm. down in service. That's what I would have. That would kind of been my key illustration That's if we'd good. done it. And uh, but we find great joy unexpectedly mm. through humility. Uh, but when we humble ourselves with Christ, the exaltation is the work of God and not of our own hands. 
That's good. That's good. All right. Well, I appreciate you sharing what yeah. you might. Do you have, have any said. bloopers? Do you have any bloopers? Oh yeah. So we get into what we didn't say on Sunday. We begin with sermon bloopers, and I don't think I did. <laughs> uh, somehow, magically, uh, apart from no, I will say this: I, I did have three application points, and I got to the end. I got to the end of my body, and I looked at the time, and I was like, "Oh boy!" It was already like. You know, in the 930 service, it was already like 1035. I hadn't made any application. And so I just only said one, do the work of humility. But I had two others, and I can't even remember them right now as I'm sitting here recording this podcast. But that was the one that was most important that I wanted people to hear. But I spent I spent a lot of time on Christology and understanding what's happening here because I think it's important. We'll talk about that some more here in a moment. But it just made this sermon pretty bulky. So that was my only blooper is I, I, I bit off more than I could chew in content, mm. uh, but thankfully was able to discern that in the moment and, and not go to 1050, which I probably would have if I would have done everything. Mm. So yeah, that was my, my only blooper. You didn't have any bloopers this week. No, but I, I told some folks, I had a lot of little things to do in our service, announcements, interviews. And they scare me far more than oh. preaching a sermon. Yes. You probably have that experience. Yes. I am more concerned about forgetting names, forgetting an announcement. <laughs> I love when I only have one thing to do on a Sunday morning, and yeah. that's preach this message. And so I was more nervous about messing up. That's and so somehow funny. I didn't, I did call Willie Rice's church Calvary Chapel. It's not Calvary Chapel. It's, it's Calvary Clearwater, Calvary Church in, in Clearwater. But um, so... I, I, I didn't insult my guests too badly. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, hey, we'll just continue. As we think about what we didn't say on Sunday, we, we begin the bulk of it with historical context, which, which is often the thing that is most commonly left on the cutting room floor. So I'll just start since I'm, you know, between the two of us, I'm the one who preached on Sunday and, uh, and just share that I didn't talk at all, and we've been hinting at this, but I just want to make this explicit because I think this is really cool. Uh, there's two things historical context related that I will mention. Uh, the first one is uh, people talk about the reception of this Christ hymn in Philippians 2. And so there are many New Testament scholars that believe Paul is citing or quoting a, a popular hymn about Jesus that was already prominent in the early church. Now, the only issue I have with that is I think the primary reason uh, people do that, scholars do that, is because it's poetic. Mm -hmm. And they will say, well, Paul doesn't write poetically. Wrong. Well, the issue with that is (laughs) he only doesn't write poetically if you discredit (laughs) the biggest piece of poetry in all of his writings in Philippians 2. So I don't know how I feel about that. I'm good either way. Uh, To be clear, I don't think there's any other... Uh, evidence that this was a a hymn outside of what we have here in Philippians 2, apart from it just being so beautiful and people like, well, this isn't Paul's writing. Well, unless it is, and this is just the way Paul writes sometimes. So anyways. Well, didn't you, I think you recommended Gordon Fee's commentary last time. And he's one that as I was studying, he makes the big argument, this is not a hymn. Yeah, He says, this is just exalted prose that's right from an apostle who's who does that in other places correct uh, so it doesn't have to be a hymn and, and I think it's important in the historical context to realize that we have such early um, testimony to these epistles in the in the uh, uh, in in what we found archaeologically that sometimes they just want to say that it was pieced together and things were put back in. Yep. And really, there's so much evidence that we have in this book what the Apostle Paul wrote originally. Yeah. And maybe the hymn came, but that was in those 20 years before, yeah. during Acts, you know, uh, it may have been put together, but who knows, Paul didn't put it together for his churches. That's right. And then reused it here. That's right. But I love the idea of thinking that this was a confession, uh, and you know they had to organize confessions for these many of them pagans, yep. all sorts of folks coming in. They needed to organize systematically yep. the thoughts. And so this may have been just a little mini systematic theology yep. that Paul did come up with. Yep. 
in a transferable way. Yep. Very memorable. Oh yeah. I've I've had this memorized since high school. We were told to memorize Philippians at my Christian school. Mm-hmm. This just flows out. Oh yeah. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I didn't talk about at all this week, although I've mentioned it uh, in weeks prior, is the the comparison between Paul's experience in Philippi and the way that he tells the story of Jesus in Philippians 2. And I think it's so close that we have to think that Paul in some ways has his experience in Philippi uh, as a, a shadow of the ultimate humility in Jesus. Because uh, you think about Paul, he goes to Philippi, he is a Roman citizen, but he goes to Philippi, he lays that citizenship aside, he's arrested uh, for doing something that wasn't illegal, right? He, he performs a miracle and is arrested for it, imprisoned as a Roman citizen. While he's in prison, he does this, well, the Lord through him does this miraculous work with this earthquake and this Philippian jailer, his whole household is saved. People are saved because he humbles himself and he goes to prison. It's a type of resurrection. Yeah, uh, and then he comes out of the prison and he says, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. And they vindicate him, mm-hmm. they exalt him, and send him out of the city. And so uh, many people have point, picked up on that and said, oh, look, look at what happened in Acts 16 and the way that Paul tells the story of Jesus in Philippians 2. It seems like Paul sees himself as a shadow. Like his experience in Philippi was just pointing to the ultimate mm. experience of humility in Jesus. Man, that's beautiful. So I, I love that. I didn't talk at all about that. Uh, and I talked some about what's going on in in Philippi that led to the this writing because this is the closest we get so far to realizing oh the, Philippi is not perfect right the church in Philippi they've got something going on there's some disunity there's some discord and we'll get to Iodia and Syntyche in a, in a few weeks and and see what's going on there but uh, just to point out hey uh, the church in Philippi isn't perfect. Paul doesn't write this for no reason. <laughs> there, there is a reason he's addressing humility and selfish ambition and those kinds of things. Uh, but I mentioned that in part, but not in, in great detail. So that's what I would say as far as historical context goes. Those are the things that, that I didn't get to. I, I think the only thing I would add is that it, it would be another good place to talk about the diversity in that city. Uh, mm. That That's sometimes the real challenge yeah. is... This was not a homogenous group. It was uh, there were all sorts of different people that had to overcome their natural prejudices and uh, their backgrounds. And it is the mind of Christ, like you said, it's a fruit of the spirit. Is is what can bring about that supernatural gathering. So part of that historical context is just a unique blend of people, uh, yeah. from prison guards to rich, purple selling ladies. You know, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so that's historical context. Those those are details that are commonly left on the cutting room floor for me, and I know for you as well, Pastor David. But let's go ahead and talk also about literary context, and that's the things that other texts that this passage is interacting with, maybe even just the preceding text before or the text that's coming. And uh, here would be a great opportunity for us to mention uh, the text that's coming, because I didn't talk at all about Timothy and Epaphroditus, now, I'm going to preach on that text this coming Sunday, but I think we're still trying to figure out the schedule here. Perhaps that's going to be a part of what's preached on this Sunday. So in, in the coming passage, Paul's going to give two examples of two men in Timothy and Epaphroditus who are living out the ethic of Philippians 2, 1 to 18. Mm-hmm. They are living out that humble, self-sacrificing posture of Christ and uh, so uh, that's an interesting thing. The only other thing I will say is uh, I mentioned this, but we could go on and on with the parallels between this text and the farewell discourse in John. Mm-hmm. And it, it's hard to know whether or not Paul would have been familiar with right. those stories. But it seems like, especially because this is a later letter for Paul as he writes to, you know, it's not as early as like First Corinthians. Mm-hmm which is near the beginning of his ministry. We, some people think 1 Corinthians is the first book of the Bible mm-hmm. that was written, the New Testament that was written. So it's later. I think there's good reason to believe 
that Paul had heard most of the stories of Jesus. Mm -hmm. If not because he had read a copy of the Gospel of John, but just because he had heard them. The, right. they, these were oral story, oral tradition that was carrying these stories around. And I think he heard the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Yeah. And the teaching of Jesus in that in that context. Because in that context of Jesus showing this example of humility, teaching them to do the same for each other, to wash each other's feet, to serve one another, it's also when Jesus says that the world will know you by your love. Mm -hmm. And and Paul's saying the same thing here. Mm -hmm. He's he's imploring them to serve one another. And then he goes on to say, when you do this, when you put the grumbling aside, you put the disputing aside, you care for one another, you serve one another, you live this out, you work out your salvation, which by the way, I didn't go into great detail on this either. I think that has more corporate of an implication than even an individual implication that, hey, this is like a work it out work out what's going on in your community. When you do that, you'll be lights that shine in the darkness. Mm -hmm. The world will know you for your love for one another. And the cool thing is, that's what the church was known for. Mm -hmm. For the first few hundred years of its existence, the church was known as the community that radically cared for people. Mm -hmm. And they, they were the community that would go to you when you had the bubonic plague. Like the, they were the ones who would, you know, gather up the babies who were left in the woods that had been discarded because they had some kind of deformity. You know, this they were known as a community that radically cared and practiced this this ethic. So, anyways, uh, as far as literary context goes, I, I don't know. You probably couldn't write a a PhD dissertation on it. It's probably not academically provable, but I feel like there's so many echoes of the farewell discourse, John 13 to 17, here in Philippians 2. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I don't know if it was uh, uh, Kevin that mentioned it when he preached this week or if it was my guest speaker, Willie, Sunday, that uh, the early church really was reflecting Christ through into the culture, through their love, just as you were saying, and that when they they tried to stamp out Christianity. They tried to stamp it out the same way they would stamp out pagan religion. They would kill the leaders. Mm. And the point that Willie was bringing out, and I had not really thought about it this way, is that because Christianity is driven by every member love for one another, and every, that you could kill the leaders and it just motivated the church. That's it right. didn't stop the church. Yeah. But in the pagan faith, if you, the the leaders led through intimidation, wealth, they had all the materials. The way to stamp out any kind of movement was to stamp out the heads, mm. and but it didn't work for Christianity. Mm. And it's because of this uniting uh, principle of love and mutual service. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. And that, we were talking about that last week, too, as we talked about Tertullian's quote, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed mm-hmm. of the church and... That idea uh, was even present in in last week. So, uh, anyways, hey, let, let's let's keep going and and thinking about what we didn't say on Sunday. That was literary context. Now we just kind of move on to any theological ideas. Mm. And man, oh man, could we <laughs> go on forever with this passage? And I'll be honest, this, this was the most like theologically dense sermon I've preached in a long time. And I took the time to explain, hey, this is what we believe as Christians. This is historic Christian faith. And I talked about canonic Christology and kenosis and why it's heresy and why it's problematic. And uh, so for our listeners now, if maybe you didn't hear that on Sunday, uh, a canonic Christology is this really heretical worldview and, and heretical doctrine that because of what it says in Philippians 2, that Jesus kenosis, he emptied himself then that means Jesus must have given up divine attributes mm. in the incarnation. And the problem with that is twofold, threefold, really. The first reason is it's it's not consistent with historic Christian teaching on the Christology, which looks at the incarnation not as subtraction, but as addition. Mm. That Jesus, as one person, fully God with a fully divine nature, takes on a fully human nature, mm-hmm. not subtraction, addition. So it's it's contrary to the historic teaching, 
The second reason is it's inconsistent with the actual reading of the text. The, the text tells us what it means by emptying himself by taking on the form of a servant. Again, addition, not subtraction. But the third reason is that I talked about is that it also leads to a bad ethic of humility. If we think about it, if the example of Jesus is surrendering, of giving up something that's true of him, then we also need to find a way to give up our humanity. Right? We need to find a way to think of ourselves with less dignity. And that's not at all what we see. Jesus doesn't surrender his identity as God, nor does he surrender any attribute of his divinity, but he takes on the form of a mm-hmm. servant. He does the action. He, he, he participates in that way. And so that's what we're called to. So we're not called to think of ourselves less. We're called to do the work of humility. We're called to take on. It's addition, not subtraction. So that's kind of a threefold, very quick reason why canonic Christology is problematic. And I wanted to deal with it because I wanted our people to understand what is the example that we're meant to imitate. It's not subtraction. It's not thinking of yourself with less dignity. It's actually knowing who you are. And because you know who you are, you can do this work and you can you can consider the interest of the other before your own. Mm. But to think about things I didn't say, sorry to spend you know three or four minutes on what I did say, but to think about things I didn't say, I could have spent a while just tracing the the theological history of uh, what we believe about the divinity and humanity of Jesus. And there's so much there. I encourage our listeners to to take a deep dive. You will end feeling like you know a little less than you knew before, mm-hmm, right? But you'll also end uh, seeing Jesus greater and right. understanding the majesty of Jesus better. And uh, and just know going in that what we affirm about Christ and His natures and His person is just as mysterious as what we affirm about the Trinity. Mm-hmm. And we we have language that's important to use the right language and and to not be wrong there. But you're not going to get to a place where you can fully comprehend uh, the uh, the persons or the hypostatic union, mm. the the persons and natures of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Yes. I came across something last week in studying this that I had never interacted with before. Have you ever interacted with what's known as the doctrine of the extra? No. As we think about Christology. No. So, so here is the doctrine of the extra. This is uh, C- Council of Constantinople. So after uh, Chalcedon, so Chalcedon is when we affirm one person, two natures. One person, the subject, is Christ, the the second person of the Trinity. Two natures, fully divine, fully human. So that's Chalcedon. Well, then Constantinople is like, okay, well, what are the implications of that? And how do we deal with this? So this is where we get close to the doctrine of the extra. And then John Calvin actually builds on this even more and uh, puts more flesh on the bones. But the doctrine of the extra is that Jesus, in his incarnation, because we need to affirm, we must affirm that he remains God, fully God, doesn't give up any of his attributes, that he still subsists in his divine nature completely, while he also subsists in his human nature completely. So people will say, well, Jesus in the incarnation, he's not omnipresent. Well, the doctrine of the extra would say, no, he is. That as he equally subsist in his divine nature, he remains omnipresent, he remains omniscient, he remains all of those things. Um, so it's just great. Like, yeah. He is still in his incarnation doing what the author of Hebrews tells us he does in sustaining all of creation by the word of his mouth. He's still doing that. He doesn't ever stop doing that. Is he doing it on autopilot? <laughs> Is that how that works? <laughs> See, that's where it gets so interesting as you think about one person, two natures. There's one subject, Jesus, uh, subsisting in these two natures, divine and human. and uh, But how those two interact with each other and what that looks like, and it, it gets so complicated. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's important to realize this is where the, the rubber meets the road in all of our interactions with other faiths and everything yep. is is who is Jesus. Yep. It doesn't take much to believe there's a God. There's lots of people believe there's a God. Yep. But to say that a literal, fleshly Jewish man 2,000 years ago was 
had in him the nature of God. He was in nature God, which Hebrews 1 confirms, Colossians confirms yeah. it. This is not the only place that talks about that. But he was fully man. And it is, it is to me, however, not harder to imagine than the triune nature of God, which is three persons, one God. Mm. I, don't think, I, I don't think I understand that. But it can sound absurd to people. Mm-hmm. And when you begin to, to flesh out, what did Christ, why did he do this? Well, it, it is to bring about a glory to God that he deserves and to prepare for us this glory to enjoy forever and ever. And it was an act of God to willingly submit himself to a plan yeah. that would actually bring more glory and we could participate in his glory as his creation in ways that uh, uh, are beyond our imagination. And, and so it's, it's, it's just hard for us to comprehend this. But I've always taught that it was he, he didn't empty himself of his nature, which I think is logically impossible. Yeah. You can't not become eternal. That's right. How does an eternal being... Exactly. Set aside or empty himself of his eternality. You yep. can't do that. What what I believe he could do is limit the independent exercise of that authority uh, to the will of the Father. This this act of submission and service to the Father for the purpose that they had agreed upon since the foundation of the world. Mm-hmm. This was a plan that Father, Son, Spirit. They agreed to this and they mutually submit to each other, to the will of God, Mm -hmm. and God the Son said, this is how I'm going to do it. I am going to willingly yield my independent exercise of this to uh, the plan, to this purpose. And I may be very shallow in this thought process, but I think that's how he did it. And um, so was he omnipresent? Yes, but he had kind of limited that. uh, uh, he, He couldn't make that any less his nature. Yeah. But the independent exercise of it would have been sin, mm-hmm. because it was independent exercise of what against his own plan. Yeah, and uh, so it's a it can it's mind blowing. But yeah. as a person of faith, I think the Holy Spirit gives you a capacity and to to actually glory in God in these thoughts. Yeah, it doesn't. It's it's. I don't have to have all the answers. To all of how this works, and as a, if you understand that your creation, it would be impossible for us to fully understand the yeah. Creator. Yeah, or we'd be the Creator. That's right. That's and we'd right. flip places, <laughs> exactly. and I don't want a God I can fully understand. Exactly. Yeah, that kind of God's limited. That's right. Yeah, and and again, that's not in any way meant to dissuade or discourage anyone from diving deeper, because. I mean, these waters are so deep, yeah. and the deeper you swim in them, yes. the higher view you will have of the Lord. Yes. Also, the greater the mystery will grow. <laughs> so, it does not confuse you. Yeah. It actually cleanses you. Yeah. It conforms you to Christ yeah. to bask in that kind of thinking and thoughtfulness, and he wanted us to do that. And this is where I'll also encourage our folks that, you know, this this is probably the least evangelical I will sound. Uh, so yeah, just get ready. Get ready. But I do think, especially with these kinds of doctrines, as we think about the doctrine of the Trinity, as we think about the doctrine of Christ and who He is, I think the the creeds are really helpful. Mm-hmm. And looking back to the historic confessions of our faith and using them as a a kind of a rule in a way to see, hey, this is the way the church has historically spoken of these things. Mm-hmm. And and the language does matter. You know, the, the language of one God, one nature, three persons. The language of one person, one Christ, two natures. Like, that language is really important and it matters. And so we, we evangelicals, we like to think of ourselves as pioneers. You know, we're paving new way everything that we do. And in a lot of ways, evangelicals have. But there are, there are things that we should look back to the church fathers, and we should look back to those creeds. And I think as we think about the Trinity, as we think about the doctrine of Christ, those are things that we really need to look back and see, man, this is how we've affirmed this from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. So, Let anyway, me ask you a question. Yeah, Can yeah. I ask you a question? Yeah. In terms of faith, 
how much does a person need to believe this trick question? Oh yeah. About this yeah. to be a true Christian? Yeah. You know, is it can they just intellectually assent, assent the fact that he was a good man, he was God's son, sort of, you know, in kind of a but not a metaphysical way or a nature way, but. I don't know that you can be saved unless it is revealed to you and you are truly yielding yourself to the divinity of Christ. Um, that's why I think Mormonism, and I often will use Mormon theology as a contrast yeah. that these are that in Jehovah's Witness theology, because this divinity of Christ is the essential doctrine. It's yeah. the essential center of all, of it all. You toss this out, you no longer have Christianity. That's right. We're saved by grace through faith. We can't have faith in someone who isn't mighty to save. Right. right. So that faith has to be rooted in the reality of who Christ is. And if Christ is not God, he is not mighty to save and cannot save us. Well and so said. that's why you know you put the you have to put the divinity of Jesus. Now, can you be uh, you know, functionally an Apollinarian? Right, like you think that the 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 logos took over a human body, and <laughs> maybe maybe you can, but you 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 cannot you cannot uh, deny the divinity of Jesus and be a believer, right? Because you don't actually have faith, right? You don't have you're not trusting in in someone who is mighty to save, who is able to actually save you. Yeah. So. Uh, but w- th- we could get really in the weeds on th- where is the line of belief. And and the great thing is we, we believe that it is God's work saving us and that after we're saved, God works in us and he reveals mm-hmm. his will and he reveals his nature and he reveals his way to us. And those things mm-hmm. become more clear, though they don't become crystal clear. As, as Paul would say, we continue to look through a mirror dimly. I've heard sometimes that part of being eternally in heaven is that we're not going to know all of God instantly and immediately. Mm. It will be an eternity of knowing God oh, more and more and more because he's eternal. I don't know who said that. That sounds like something C.S. Lewis would yeah, say. But I don't that know. <laughs> you're never going to get bored and go, oh, I got God down. Yeah. What's next? Yeah. Never. Oh, that's good. He's eternally deep. Yeah. And uh, that part of the joy of heaven is continually glorying in all that we discover yeah. about him. That's good. All right. Well, um, hey, I don't ever have stories or illustrations that I didn't share because I share all of them because I have so very few. <laughs> but um, hey, anything else you want to add to That's what we it, did man. say on Sunday? That's awesome. Like Thank I said, you. we don't make promises. We're at like 38 minutes right now. This is what we do. We just go long. We're preachers. But uh, we, we thank you for listening. And we'll just go ahead and tell our listeners now, we will not be recording next week. Uh, neither David nor I am preaching this Sunday. But then, as far as we can tell, the ne- the week following, we'll find ourselves in a rhythm, potentially through Christmas, where we'll both be preaching and we'll be back with you. Because when we are preaching together, like always, we're going to have things we don't get to, things left on the cutting room floor, sermon leftovers, and we'll be back to share with you what we didn't say on Sunday. <laughs>